Wow, such handsome faces. We miss seeing you all. And just a note to our online congregation, if you have a child or a, a child that you would like to have receive one of these faith markers, we would be glad to mail that to you. If you're not in the area, if you're uh, from afar, we can see that you get a copy of that and, and give that as a gift. That's one way we want. We feel like we can resource um, not only the children, but their parents and, and friends as well. Wow, so what a collection of characters in this series, the Hebrew Bible characters revisited. The first week we visited Job, Pastor Josh reminded us that we can relate to Job with bad news after bad news, that this ancient scripture is timely even for today. Job is keeping it real and it helps us to live a real life with real faith and real questions. Last week we visited, revisited Ruth, a Moabite woman. She bravely followed her mother-in-law to the ends of the earth, or at least to Naomi's home and people, the Israelites. Ruth, in Ruth we saw Hesed, a love that expects nothing in return. This love works for justice where all have enough and none has too much. And this week we revisit another strong and brave woman. We turn to Esther, now this is a story that we don't often give a lot of time and attention to in the Christian tradition. It is, however, a story that is pivotal in the Jewish faith as it commemorates the saving of the Jewish people from Haman, a Persian Empire official who was planning to kill all the Jews in the, in the empire. According to an ages old tradition, yearly Esther de Esther's deeds are remembered and celebrated in the Feast of Purim. Of all the festivals in the Jewish year, this is the most joyful. It's kind of a grand party in many ways. One commentary claims that this festival comes closer to the streets of New Orleans before Ash Wednesday, what we know as Mardi Gras, than a serious reading in the temple. Definitely, it's a time to eat and drink and be very, very merry. Not to be outdone by the ever popular Super Bowl parties in our culture, the Jews would have had their versions of wings and pizza and nachos and more, for sure. And imbibing, imbibing beverages in, access, in excess was expected, although nothing is mentioned about a team of Clydesdales. Well, let's turn to scripture, at least for part of the Esther story. Esther spoke to Hatat and gave him a message for Mordecai saying, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law. All alike are to be put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone may that person live. I myself have not been called to come into the king for 30 days. When they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows, perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Well, let's give some context to this story. The setting was the great Persian empire probably 2,400 years ago. The Jewish people had been overrun by the Chaldeans and had been taken into exile in Babylon. 50 years later, Babylon was conquered by the Persians and the Jews were allowed to return home. Some, however, chose to stay. They had discovered that God was not just in Israel, but that God was with them in Babylon and in Persia too. 
Uncle Mordecai and Esther were among those Jews who chose to stay. The Jewish minority was well assimilated into the culture, but viciously hated by some, including a powerful minister of state named Haman. By vilifying the Jews, Haman manipulated the king into issuing a decree that would wipe out all of the Jews in the empire. And since Israel was still technically a part of the Persian Empire at that point, this meant that the king's decree threatened, essentially, to eliminate the Jews from history altogether. Even those who had returned home were in peril. Fear gri gripped the Jewish community as, it, as there seemed to be no way out. However, Queen Esther, the favorite in the king's harem, was unbeknownst to anyone except Mordecai, a Jew. Mordecai named this one faint hope for the Jews, that Esther could petition the king to spare her people. But being queen, however, did not give Esther automatic intimacy or safety that one might imagine. If he wasn't inclined to grant her audience and grant her plea by holding out the golden scepter, death for Esther was imminent. So Esther initially said no, she wouldn't petition the king. It was too dangerous. Mordecai's response to her was indeed sobering. If you keep silent, we will all perish. A decisive moment. Esther stops denying, stops ignoring, stops making excuses, stops running away. She had heard the message, and she got it. Maybe God put you here, Esther, for exactly this moment, for such a time as this. And Esther realizes that she needs more than her own strength, so she falls back on the devotional practices of her people, and she calls on the Jews to fast with her, known as Esther Fast. She resolves that she will face her opportunity and that she will go to the king with his great and powerful scepter. She recognized that what she must do must include disclosing her true identity as a Jew. She realizes the reality of that revelation, and she says simply, if I die, I die. Esther is bold, Esther is brave, and Esther says yes. The long and the short of it is, the king is smitten with Esther. He waves his scepter, he grants her plea, the Jews are saved and there is rejoicing in the land. And although this book takes a bit of a twist at the end, the scroll from which it is read at Purim holds a very happy ending for Esther and her people. And they celebrate their salvation with feasting and merrymaking. It is declared a Jewish holiday for all time and the people are happy beyond words. You know, sometimes these days, life doesn't seem so happy all the time. Times are stressful. It's felt like we're in the throes of an especially long and cold winter, especially this, this cold snap that we're in right now. While I am a half glass, kind of per half glass full kind of person, there are times that my spirit has wanted to hibernate. I had a pleasant surprise this week as I met with my spiritual director. As always, she was encouraging. She reminded me that sometimes winter can seem dead and dormant. She was getting ready to post a blog entitled, From the Seeds of Winter. In it, she reflects, while during winter, when much seed seems dormant, even the weed seeds seem dormant, there is much happening below the surface for many plants, hard, harsh conditions are essential to live. Many seeds need winter to germinate and to grow into plant food, planthood. Stratification involves the freezing and the thawing of the ground that breaks down the tough outer shell of the seeds so that when the time is right, they can sprout. The surprising miracle is that this hardship produces growth. And while we may want to coddle and nurture our plants, softly talking, and at one, at one time we even sang to our plants, 
uh, to water them and to feed them just right and take really good care. It's both that tenderness and the hardship that are needed for full development. She continues that if we try to help a butterfly break through its chrysalis, we may keep it from ever flying at all. Each butterfly must go through the difficult experience of emerging for itself. And maybe it's the same for us humans. The God-given gifts that lie dormant in our spirits sprout forth most strongly through painful, harsh conditions. Maybe this pandemic, these uncertain and precarious and changing times are preparing us for what is next in our life together, helping us too to be brave, to be bold, and to say yes. These past two years, we've experienced what has felt like an endless pandemic winter. We have experienced great loss at many different levels. For some, it has been the illness or death of someone we love, or perhaps the loss has been time separate from family and friends. Many of our young people and teachers have experienced the loss of being able to be together at times to learn in the classroom. We've been lonely, we've been fearful, but as my spiritual director reminds me, the pain continues to open new depths of strength and new breadth of compassion. During these difficult days, we, like the seeds, are still growing. In the midst of hardship and pain, our gifts unfold, and we have and will experience the miracle of becoming more fully the person and the people that God created us to be. We are growing toward living our best life, ready for whatever and wherever God leads us next, calling out our gifts for such a time as this. Such is the wisdom and the power of Mordecai. He looks below the surface. He sees Esther as someone who could be an active participant in the saving acts of God. She is more than her caricature, a glamour, a glamour queen. She is a child of God who has potential, who is capable and who is called to act. Mordecai doesn't make her these things. Rather, Mordecai calls them out of her. He calls out the gifts that are uniquely hers to share with the world. Esther's story is one of hope a young woman in the court of a mighty king, a young woman valued more for her beauty than for her brains, a young woman willing to risk her own safety and security for the well-being of her people, and she calls attention to a desperate situation. She has only a few words at her disposal with the king, words that must be very well chosen. Esther speaks, and history is changed. Esther is a hero. She was born for such a time as this. Perhaps Mordecai has similar words for us. Maybe, just maybe, we were put here in this place for such a time as this. We have the gifts, the talents, the positions to affect real change and real good in this world. There's a quote that I've kept on my desk in my office by Marianne Williamson. She says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be the best I can be? Actually, she continues, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. We are all meant to shine. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. And it's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And we let our own light shine and we unknowingly give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, 
our presence automatically liberates others. After unending months of navigating COVID-19 and the long struggling amidst the unveiling of the Delta and Omicron variants, we feel compelled to remind ourselves, to remind ourselves, to remind our church and to remind the community that we belong to a people born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. We are called as Esther from our own agendas, our egos, our insecurities to act for those in need in our world. We are called as Mordecai to raise up others, to call out the abilities and the gifts of others that they too might use their gifts and act decisively for the good, for honor, and for virtue. For Esther's and Mordecai's story is our story, and theirs is a story that continues in every generation. God's time for Esther and Mordecai was then. Now it is our time, and we too have been brought to a moment for a time such as this. We are surrounded by so great a crowd of witnesses, physically here next week in this room and in spirit beyond these walls. Perhaps we've encountered Mordecai's along the way who have called out our gifts and our skills, and perhaps we're waiting to hear that call. But called we are, called to find our best voice and to find our power, and now we hear and answer the call for such a time as this. It's been a long journey, one that has taken much grace, grace and patience. Never in recent history has the world more needed hope and good news, the gospel of God's amazing love and peace for all of God's creation. We are bearers of light and preachers of the good news. As Esther, we are called to be bold, to be brave, to say yes. We are witnesses to one another's yes. As God's beloved, we are claiming our place. We are creating our space, embracing our power, celebrating our ancestors, reclaiming our heritage of strength in community, stirring up the gifts of the people, gifts of patience and compassion and love. And for that, we give God deepest thanks and we pledge our love and our support to one another. May we each individually and together as a community have the wisdom, the vision, the courage to be bold, to be brave, and to say yes, to live and to share and proclaim God's love for such a time as this.